Oliver Munson was last seen in Catonsville, Maryland, on February the 13th of 1984. A neighbor saw him leaving his home at about 7.50 a.m. That, that day, presumably heading to Howard County, Maryland, where he was working as an industrial arts teacher at the Ellicott City Middle School. He never made it to school that day, however, and was never heard from again. His family reported him missing the following day on February the 14th. On February 16, Munson's 1980 Ford Pinto was found parked at the Brayside, was found parked on Brayside Road in Catonsville, two blocks from his house. The right front tire was flat. Munson's touring, Munson's hat, school notebook, and lunch bag were inside the vehicle. There was no sign of him, however, at the scene. Two weeks later, on February the 27th, after Munson's disappearance, two video store receipts with his name, traces of human blood, and a spent small caliber shell casing were found in a blue 1973 Datsun parked at the edge of Leakin Park in West Baltimore, Maryland. The vehicle had been reported as stolen the same day Munson vanished. The blood in the car was typo positive, but no one knows Munson's blood type, and DNA technology wasn't available in 1984. Now, the sample, unfortunately, is too deteriorated to be tested, so it has never been confirmed whether or not it was his blood. Authorities believe Munson may have been murdered in retaliation for giving evidence against an automobile theft ring. He had unknowingly purchased a stolen vehicle from one of the thieves, Dennis Watson, a year prior to his disappearance. This was the same car that he w that was found at Leakin Park. Munson was scheduled to testify against Watson on February the 16th, three days prior to his disappearance. Watson pled guilt, guilty to auto theft and was sentenced to 10 years in prison. He was paroled in 1989. In 1973, a man was scheduled to testify against Watson in an armed robbery case, and he was killed. Watson was charged with first-degree murder, but he was never brought to trial because one of the witnesses in the murder case had died. Watson's current whereabouts are unknown. He was interviewed about Munson's disappearance, but maintains his innocence. Munson graduated from the University of Maryland at East Shore. He was very popular and liked at the Ellicott City Middle School and took his students bowling twice a week. He was one of six children and was known to be a recluse by nature. He enjoyed working on old cars, which he kept in his yard and frequently left town on the weekends to visit his mother and siblings on the Eastern Shore. He was declared legally dead in 1985. The judge ruled he was victim of a presumed homicide. No one has ever been charged with his disappearance and his case remains unsolved. Judy Wardrip was last seen at her job at the Bethany Motel in Bethany, Missouri at noon on December the 10th of 1984. The motel, started by her father, was the family business. Wardrip worked alongside her sister. She arrived for her shift that morning, accompanied by her dog, Moppet. When Wardrip's sister returned to the motel that evening to start her shift, she found no, tr no trace of Judy. This was unusual behavior for Judy, as she was known to be very responsible and wouldn't leave the motel unattended for an extended period of time. The only indication of Wardrop's presence was a cup of coffee in one of the rooms that she'd been cleaning, with the TV still on. Judy's sister contacted the police, who initiated a search. However, no clues were found. None of the motel's guests reported witnessing anything unusual that day as well. Wardrobe vanished along with her dog, but she left her purse, ID, money, clothing, and jewelry behind. Despite having recently visited her tired dad in Corpus Christi, Texas, Judy showed no signs of depression or distress. 
She even purchased Christmas presents for her family, indicating no intention of disappearing. While Judy's mother had battled depression herself and died by suicide, died from suicide some years prior to Wardrop's disappearance, Wardrop herself had never displayed any signs of depression herself. Her family believed she would have reached out if she could have, leading them to suspect foul play. Despite extensive efforts, Judy's case remains unsolved. Marcos Cruz was last seen in San Juan, Puerto Rico on December the 15th, 1984. He was abandoned outside a Catholic church, possibly in the San Truce district by a member of the House of Prayer for All People, a cult-like religious group led by Anne Elizabeth Young, formerly known as Anna Davidson. The House of Prayer for All People was known for its extreme beliefs and practices, including collectivism, adherence to a kosher diet, and wearing full-length robes and head coverings. Anna Young was particularly harsh towards members, especially after her husband's death in 1988. She objected them to physical and emotional abuse, forcing them to surrender their savings and some separated parents from their children. In 1984, Anna ordered a cult member to abandon Marcos in Puerto Rico, alleging he was full of the devil. The group dissolved in 1992 after Anna was convicted of child abuse for bathing a 12-year-old in bleach, leaving her tied to a bed with severe burns. Anna fled with her youngest daughter, Joy, before the sentencing. She resurfaced in Illinois in 2000, where she served six months in jail for child abuse. In 2017, Joy accused Anna of killing a toddler known as Moses Young, later identified as Iman Harper. Former cult members corroborated Joy's account, alleging that Anna beat and starved Iman to death sometime between either 1988 or 1989. Another child, Catania Jackson, died under suspicious circumstances after Anna withheld her epilepsy me medication. Anna was charged with Iman's murder in 2017 and ultimately pled no contest to second-degree murder in Iman's case in manslaughter and Catania's death. She was sentenced to 30 years in prison but died 33 days into her sentence in February of 2021. Despite the revelations about Anna's crimes, no one was charged with the disappearance of either Catherine Davidson Anna's stepdaughter, who vanished in 1973, or Marcos Cruz. Annette Vale was last seen by her family on October the 5th of 1984 in Sulphur, Louisiana. Her husband, Felix Vale Sr., informed neighbors that she'd gone to visit friends in Denver, Colorado. However, Annette never reached her, de her supposed destination and was never heard from again. Annette's mother reported her missing on October the 22nd. Felix told authorities that Annette had suffered from mental illness and had left on her own accord, claiming she took a bus from St. Louis, Missouri to Mexico, not Denver. There's uncertainty regarding whether Annette actually arrived in Mexico. Previously, it said that she went to Mexico sometime in her teens, fell in love with a local man and attempted to convince him to move from Mexico to the U.S. with her. Law enforcement found Felix's explanation kind of, kind of suspicious, particularly since the bus station he mentioned didn't exist. Nevertheless, no evidence of foul play was discovered. In summer of 1984, Felix filed for divorce, citing irreconcilable differences and desertion, and subsequently donated all of Annette's belongings and clothing to charity. Felix had a history prior to Annette's disappearance. His first wife, Mary Elizabeth Horton Vale, drowned in Louisiana in 1962, with suspicions surrounding her death. Despite initially being cleared of any involvement, Felix was eventually convicted of her murder in 2016, more than five decades later. 
Additionally, Felix's second partner, Sharon Hensley, disappeared in 1973, with Felix providing questionable explanations of her disappearance, similar to those with Annette. In both cases, Felix's accounts lacked credibility and were very inconsistent. Both Annette and Felix's relationship was also troubled with multiple dynamics. They married when Annette was 17, after which she received a significant life insurance pay payout from her deceased father's estate. Annette later expressed intentions of divorcing Felix and reconciling with her mother, but ultimately returned to Felix, making him the sole, the sole beneficiary of the residence. Felix's behavior towards Annette's family and his contradictory statements further fueled suspicions. Despite claims of maintaining contact with Annette after her disappearance, Felix failed to provide evidence supporting this claim. Moreover, his abrupt departure from Mississippi upon renewed scrutiny of Mary's death and the missing women cases raised additional red flags. In 2013, Felix was arrested and subsequently convicted of Mary's murder, receiving a life sentence without parole. He continues to maintain that both Hensley and Annette are alive, yet undisclosed and implicated in some purported witness protection programs. Annette's disappearance remains unsolved, with law enforcement suspecting foul play given the circumstances. Tulsa, Oklahoma... Police are currently overseeing the investigation into Annette's whereabouts. Tessie and Frank Poza were last seen in Spokane, Washington, on October 26, 1984. They managed the Spokane Street Motel and typically closed it during the fall and winter for their annual trip to Hawaii, where they intended to settle permanently upon retirement, having put having recently acquired 24 acres of land there. In preparation for their 1984 trip, they bought their plane tickets on October the 30th, but failed to use them. They also missed their scheduled drop-off at the kennel of their two dogs, an Akita and a mixed breed, which, had, which were never located. On October the 29th, they were seen taking their camper to, to a Spokane warehouse. By 7 p.m. that same day, an unidentified individual took the camper, which was later discovered at Spokane International Airport's long-term lot before 1 a.m. on the 30th of October. Since the Posars didn't maintain regular contact with their acquaintances while in Hawaii and lacked a telephone at the residence, their absence was really unnoticed for weeks wasn't until Christmas passed without any communication from them that their children raised concerns. Authorities were notified on January the 7th of 1985. Despite owning properties in Spokane and having real estate upward, worth upwards of $500,000, the Posars had no significant debts or criminal records. Investigators suspected foul play right away. Their son, Frank Pozar, became the primary suspect. In December of 1986, he was convicted of theft and forgery for cashing his parents' savings bonds, using their credit cards without consent, and forging his mother's signature on a $550 check after the disappearance. He served 20 months in prison but denied any involvement in their disappearance. Frank claimed that he'd used their money to maintain the Spokane Street Motel, where he moved shortly after their disappearance, claiming that they'd permitted him to, from living there. He told conflicting stories about his parents' whereabouts, suggesting they were sailing, but not in Hawaii. Before they disappeared, tensions arose between Frank and his parents due to his mishandling of property investments. He became estranged from them after they refused any further financial support to him. Despite suspicions, Frank Jr. never cooperated fully with authorities. 
He refused to do a lie detector test. And in addition, after the newspapers asked him to go about one, he refused that as well, too. After their disappearance, possessions they would have taken to Hawaii were found with Frank Jr., including suitcases in the motel basement. However, he has never been charged in connection to the disappearance. Frank, Frank Jr.'s had multiple encounters with authorities since 1984 and has lost contact with his sister. His current whereabouts are unknown. However, his last known residence was in Washington, D.C. Tessie had limited education while Frank Sr. completed his sophomore year of high school. Their daughter, Rose, now manages the motel, which has been converted into apartments. The case of the Posars remains unsolved. Sandy Cornett was last seen in Charlotte, North Carolina at 6.30 p.m. on November the 18th, 1984. That evening, she had dinner with her fiancé at, at her residence on 8900 Eagle Wind Drive. After dinner, her fiancé drove back to his home in South Carolina. Once he got home, he attempted to call Sandy. However, he didn't get a response. This was the last known correspondence with Sandy. No signs of struggle were found in the home, and her car remained parked in the driveway. However, a purse was found with its contents scattered on the bed. The only items missing from the residence were clothes Sandy wore that day, her calculator, and an ATM card. The wallet with the ATM card's additional contents was left behind. In the weeks following Sandy's disappearance, her, her ATM card was used three times by an unidentified man and woman to withdraw, attempt to withdraw $1,000 from her account in East Charlotte. The woman using the card matched Sandy's description, though her identity or the identity of the man, for that matter, remain unknown. Larry Jean Bell, a serial killer who knew Sandy, emerged as a prime suspect in her disappearance. At the time of her disappearance, Bell was staying at a residence on Will Hill Road, about four miles from her home. Moreover, he had allegedly stolen an ATM card from a former girlfriend withdrawing $700 from her account. Bell was convicted of murders of two young women in South Carolina in 1985 and received a death sentence. Despite being suspected in Sandy's case and several other young women in North Carolina, including Denise Porch in 1975, he was never formally charged in connection with Sandy's disappearance. Despite maintaining his innocence in Sandy's case, Bell was executed in 1996. His legal team attempted to overturn his death sentence, arguing his mental illness and his sudden belief in Jesus Christ, if you can believe that one. Sandy, originally from Millers Creek, North Carolina, had an associate's degree in secretarial science from Wilkes Community College. At the time of her disappearance, she worked as an insurance claim adjuster at Gay and Taylor Company and worked part-time as a model for the Charlotte Merchandise Mart. Sandy was close to her family, contacting her, fa her parents at least once a week. Her, her wedding, scheduled for April the 20th of 1986, never occurred. Sandy's disappearance to this day remains unsolved. Gary Kurgan was last seen leaving the Night Spot Lounge on Plank Road in Baton Rouge, Louisiana on November the 28th, 1984. He was accompanied by Layla Erica Mola, a teenage stripper. When Kurgan vanished, he was carrying $2,000 in cash. He never made contact with anyone else ever again. Later, his pink Cadillac was discovered abandoned and Metairie in Medary, 
Louisiana, with pools of blood found inside the trunk. If I messed up that name, please let me know. Authorities suspected that Moolah and her boyfriend, Ronnie Delton Dunnigan, were responsible for Kurgan's disappearance. They fled to Las Vegas, Nevada after Kurgan went missing. During a search of Moolah and Dunnigan's apartment on Byron Street, investigators discovered signs of a violent struggle, including bloodstains. Entries in Moolah's diary indicated premeditation for Kurgan's murder. Both Moolah and Dunnigan were arrested and initially charged with murder, although Moolah implicated Dunnigan in the crime during police questioning. They were released three months later due to lack of evidence. Twenty-five year li- years later, however, the case was reopened. On December of 2012, Moolah and Dunnigan were rearrested in Kurgan's disappearance. DNA evidence linked bloodstains found in, the, on, in their apartment to Kurgan. Dunnigan was living in Bossier City, Louisiana, while Moolah was in New York City at the time of their second arrests. Despite being charged again, the grand jury didn't indict Dunnigan, and he was released. Moolah pled guilty to manslaughter in the spring of 2014 and agreed to cooperate in the case against Dunnigan. With Moolah's testimony and additional evidence, Dunnigan was indicted and convicted of second-degree murder in 2015, receiving life in prison. Gary Kurgan co-owned a chain of Sonic drive-in restaurants in southern Louisiana and was married with a son. He was declared legally dead in 1986, but his body has never been found. Foul play is strongly suspected in his case due to the circumstances that are involved. Paula Godfrey was reportedly hired by John Edward Robinson Sr. in 1984 in Overland Park, Kansas. Godfrey was very interested in pursuing a business career, and she told her family that Robinson had arranged for her and a group of women to take a trip to San Antonio, Texas, where they were going to enroll in a clerical skills course. Godfrey believed she was hired to work as a sales representative for his Kansas management consultant firm, Equitu. Her family members had told the authorities that John Robinson picked her up at their residence at their home in Overland Park on September the 1st of 1984 and said he would drive her to the airport for the flight. This is the last time she would ever be seen. She was never heard from again. Godfrey's dad traveled to San Antonio to search for her after she failed to reach anyone for days after she left. He learned that she never checked into her motel on September the 1st. Her father, returning to Overland Park, contacted John at the Equitu offices. He demanded that Robinson tell God free to contact her parents within the next three days. Godfrey's family received a note postmarked from Kansas City, Kansas, days afterwards that was written by, supposedly, by Paula. They immediately forwarded it to the police department. The letter was typed and contained multiple spelling and typing errors, which Godfrey's loved ones knew was very, very unlike her. Letter stated that Paula planned to start over and run away from Overland Park, but didn't say anything where she was planning to planning to go to. She also thanked John Robinson in the letter and told her family that she was good. Her family and authorities believed that the note was forged and intended to push them push them and the investigators away from any questioning of John Robinson's involvement. Now, in the case of John Robinson, multiple other women would come into play with his case. Lisa Stasi disappeared as well from Overland Park a year later in 1985 with her infant daughter, Tiffany. Now, 
Lisa to this day has never been found. However, Tiffany would be illegally adopted by Robinson's brother and sister-in-law sometime later in 1985. Investigators determined that Equa 2 was used as a front for a black market baby brokering operation run by John Robinson. Authorities believe he killed Lisa in order to get Tiffany. Robinson's illegal activities continued on into the 1990s when he was released from his most recent prison sentence and began assaulting women that he'd met online. Authorities reopened their investigation into Paula Godfrey's disappearance when Robinson's name was linked to a Kansas storage facility that contained barrels holding the remains of five women. Robinson is also a prime suspect in the disappearance of Catherine Clampett, a woman who vanished without a trace in 1987. One of Robinson's former associates in 2000 said that Robinson paid him $50,000 during the mid-80s to recruit women for an escort service he operated in Kansas. The associate claimed that he was a friend of Godfrey's and convinced her to contact Robinson, though she most likely didn't know the true motives at the time. The associate said that he blamed himself for Paula's disappearance. Robinson was convicted of Lisa's murder and the murders of two additional women in Kansas in October of 2002. A jury recommended that he receive the death penalty for the other women's homicides and life in prison for the murder of Lisa Stasi. Paula Godfrey was an accomplished amateur figure skater prior to her disappearance in 1984. She was a graduate of Olath North High School in 1983. To this day, her case remains unsolved. Kim Leggett was last seen standing outside Ross Cotton Gin, her job in Mercedes, Texas, on October the 9th of 1984. The establishment was owned by her father-in-law, and Leggett worked there as a secretary. 4.30 p.m., a customer came to the business with a load of produce, and Leggett helped him weigh it. Shortly afterwards, she was talking to two men. They were standing next to Leggett's car and another white car, possibly a sports car. When the customer came by with another load at 5 p.m., Leggett was gone. At 4.45 that same day, Leggett's parents received two phone calls saying that she'd been kidnapped and the abductors wanted a ransom. They thought it was a joke at first. They tried to call the gin to see if Leggett was there, but got no answer. Her father then drove to the gin and found her car parked there with her purse and keys inside. Leggett was in college studying to be an x-ray tech, and her books were found in, on the desk in the office with a pencil to mark her place. There was also a calculator, there was also a calculator on the book as well. Leggett herself, however, was gone and, to this, and has never been seen or heard from since. A ransom note was mailed to the family shortly after, demanding $250,000. The letter appeared to be in Leggett's handwriting, but the envelope was in a, no was in a different person's handwriting. Leggett's stepfather, Lefty Gardner, was a pilot and member of the Confederate Air Force, now called the Commemorative Air Force at the time of her disappearance. Some theorized that Gardner refused to smuggle contraband into Mexico, and Leggett was, Leggett's kidnapping was in retaliation for his refusal, but no evidence is really around to really support this theory. Leggett's husband was also looked at as a possible suspect. He, however, cooperated with authorities in the investigation and maintains his innocence in the case. He obtained a divorce from Leggett after her abduction. Foul play is suspected in Leggett's case. She left behind her husband and one-year-old son. Those believe Leggett was the victim of a homicide. However, as stated, no suspects have been named in her disappearance. Sharon McCulley was last seen on December the 11th, 1984, at 1.40 p.m. in Austin, Texas. 
She was driving east on Howard Lane towards Interstate 35 after leaving a lunch date with her husband of two and a half years. McCauley was out Christmas shopping that day. Witnesses reported possible sightings of McCauley's vehicle, a white 1965 Volkswagen, Volkswagen Beetle with a faded orange hood and missing front bumper parked near a shopping mall on Bee Cave Road that afternoon. However, these sightings have never been confirmed. When McCulley's husband returned home from work at 6.30 p.m., she wasn't there. Concerned, he spent the night waiting for her and contacted friends and family to see if anyone had heard from her. The following day, he contacted police to report her missing. Two days after her disappearance, McCulley's unlocked and abandoned Volkswagen was found in an apartment complex at the 8600 block of Research Boulevard, about five and a half miles from where she was last seen. The car's white rope, previously used to hold down the hood after its latch broke, was missing. McCulley's purse, containing approximately $170 in cash, and her keys were also missing from the vehicle. There were no signs of foul play, however, but a partial fingerprint was found on and inside the vehicle. However, there is insufficient evidence to identify any suspects. One witness reported seeing McCulley getting out of the car with a man, but this sighting was never confirmed. McCulley lived in an apartment on Avenue G at the time of her disappearance and was employed with the IRS. She aspired to pursue a degree in biology and attended medical school. Her husband was a mechanic. Her husband, who was a mechanic, passed a polygraph test regarding her disappearance. They were said to have a happy marriage and recently purchased land to build their first home. Though you suspect McCulley was abducted against her will and her case remains unsolved. Ernest Vereen vanished from Garden City, South Carolina on October the 10th, 1984. He co-owned and managed a mobile home park with his son, Alan, and resided in one of the mobile homes. Oddly, he missed several appointments that day and left his car in the carport at home. When Alan checked Ernest's residence, he noticed the blinds were closed and a basket had toppled over in the kitchen. A far cry from Ernest's unusual tidiness. Later on that evening, Alan received a call claiming Ernest had been kidnapped, with instructions to find a ransom note in Alan's mailbox. Instead of complying, Alan contacted the authorities. Inside the mailbox, a police officer discovered Ernest's driver's license, along with a typed ransom note demanding $250,000 within 48 hours to ensure his safety. Alan, cooperating with the authorities, gathered 75000 with marked bills and documented their serial numbers. Following the kidnapper's instructions, Alan, wearing a wire and under police surveillance, journeyed to various phone booths in Myrtle Beach in Conway, South Carolina. Eventually, Alan was instructed to leave the money in a black garbage bag beneath a bridge on U.S. 501. A man fitting the description provided a five foot seven individual with a white beard collecting the money. Alan identified the suspect as Alvin Owens, a handyman who'd previously worked for Ernest. Owens was apprehended the same day in charge of the kidnapping. Most of the ransom money, except for $18, was recovered from his possession. Incriminating evidence, including handwritten drafts of ransom notes, a rental receipt for a typewriter matching the one used to put the notes together, and Ernest's own personal belongings were found with Owen's family, linking him to the crime. In January of 1985, Owens was convicted with Ernest kidnapping. Subsequently, in May of 1986, he was convicted of Ernest's murder, marking the first murder conviction without a body in South Carolina's history. Though his initial conviction was overturned in 1988, Owens was retried and sentenced to life imprisonment without parole in 1991. Owens later claimed involvement with a terrorist group called the Weather Underground, alleging they coerced him into committing the crime.
1994, he offered to disclose Ernest's burial site near U.S. 17 Bypass in Myrtle Beach, but despite extensive search efforts, no remains were ever found. Ernest's disappearance remains suspect with foul play due to the circumstances of the case. On November 13, 1984, Tammy Bellinger was last seen walking toward Lincoln Street School in Exeter, New Hampshire. Despite a neighbor spotting her crossing Court Street around 8 a.m., Tammy never arrived at school that day. She would never be seen again. It wasn't until after school concluded that Tammy's disappearance was reported to law enforcement, as Lincoln Street School didn't confirm students' absences until after her vanishing. Despite extensive searches of the area, little evidence surfaced in regards to Tammy's whereabouts. In a desperate attempt to uncover clues, authorities received a tip suggesting Tammy may have been buried in the Exeter Cemetery within a grave dig in 1984. However, upon excavation, only the remains of a 91-year-old woman who was supposed to be there were found. Another search effort in 1996 involving a drainage ditch came about. However, this yielded no clues to where Tammy was. Victor Juan Yeti swiftly emerged as a suspect in Tammy's disappearance. He was employed at Brad's Custom Auto Body on Main Street in Exeter, just blocks from where Tammy was last seen. Now... His criminal record, dating back to the 1960s, included convictions for forced entry, larceny, and sexual assaults. Furthermore, he also was a suspect in the 1984 disappearance of Marjorie Luna in Florida, as he resided near Christie's residence at the time of her disappearance. This case as well remains unsolved. Despite suspicions around Victor, he was never formally charged in connection with either disappearance, and no physical evidence tied him to either case. However, during his trial for burglary and an an indecent exposure in Florida in 1992, prison inmates testified that Victor confessed to killing both Christie and Tammy. Despite this revelation... He was only sentenced he was only sentenced to seventy five years and released late and released in twenty twelve, passing away eight months after his release. Although Victor was incarcerated for burglary in Florida in nineteen ninety two, no charges were ever brought to him against him in the case of either Tammy or Luna, with no tangible evidence linking him to the cases. Unfortunately, Tammy remains missing, and her case remains unsolved. Esther Valdez was last seen after school in Chama, New Mexico, on September the 7th, 1984. Her and her best friend, Cindy Redwine, picked up their paychecks from the Branding Iron restaurant, where she worked as a dishwasher, drank some whiskey, and visited the grave of Esther's baby sister, who died years prior. At the gravesite, Esther told Redwine she loved her parents and was tired of hurting them. The friends left in separated ways after that. At approximately midnight, Esther went to Redwine's home, accompanied by an older man. They invited her to go camping. Redwine refused and told Esther not to go either. Esther and the man left at that point in in his Bronco. Esther was never seen or heard from again, but days later, her wallet was found in Chama. There are possible sightings of her in Colorado and Albuquerque and Farmington, New Mexico, after her disappearance. However, neither of these cases have ever been, con- neither of these sightings, I should say, have never been confirmed. Redwine stated that she knew the man Esther was last seen with and asked him where she'd gone. He said that he had left her at Redwine's home. She told him that she knew his story was, wasn't true. He himself denied ever hurting her. 
This individual apparently left Albuquerque sometime after the disappearance. He's never publicly been identified. At the time of her disappearance, Esther was scheduled to appear as a witness in the trial of a, of a bar owner. He'd been cited for allowing her into Ben's lounge, where, as I said earlier, she is underage. She disappeared, however, prior to this trial taking place. It's unclear whether Esther's scheduled testimony had anything to do with her vanishing. However, after she went missing, her family and friends heard rumors she was murdered at a party at Ben's Lounge on the night that she'd vanished. Esther was a student at Escalante High School in 1984 and had five younger siblings. She dreamed of becoming a beautician. Now, despite her, her young age, she did drink on a number of, was known to drink um, for her age and dated older men. She'd also previously run away from home on multiple occasions. However, she'd never been gone for these extended periods of time. Her case remains unsolved. Mary Badaracco, employed as a house cleaner in Sherman, Connecticut, in 1984, had a tumultuous relationship with her husband, Dominic Badaracco, who had a history himself of infidelity and domestic violence. Mary discovered Dominic's affair and decided to file for divorce. Her daughters last heard from her on August the 19th. They reported her missing almost two weeks later on the 31st of August. Dominic claimed he last saw Mary on August the 20th when she packed up her belongings and left their home in, on Wakeman Hill Road. However, none of Mary's personal belongings were found by her daughters inside the house. Her car, a 1982 Chevy Cavalier, was parked outside with the driver's side windshield smashed inwards and shards of glass on the front seat. Mary's keys and wedding ring were left on the kitchen counter, while her clothes and framed pictures were missing. Dominic claimed he gave Mary between $100,000 and $250,000 as a part of an informal settlement, after which she allegedly packed up and, and moved away. Mary's daughters, who were close to her in 1984, emphasized she would never have left them without informing either of them. Dominic instructed them not to disclose Mary's absence and told the police that she'd left him. Admitted to smashing the car windshield, but no evidence of foul play was found. The car later vanished without a trace. Dominic moved in with another woman and her daughter shortly after Mary disappeared, and he eventually married her. Two days before Mary was reported missing, Dominic filed for a divorce on grounds of abandonment. Mary was not represented at the divorce hearing held in August of 1985. In 1990, Mary's case was reclassified as a homicide case based on an informant's tip suggesting involvement with the Hells Angels motorcycle gang due to a contract on Mary's life. The informant claimed that Dominic's son, Joseph, but he refused to cooperate with authorities. Another individual, Stephen Kendall, failed a lie detector test and later died in a motorcycle accident. Authorities searched the property in 2007. However, no evidence was found. Ernest Dockhausen, charged with interfering in the investigation, was acquitted in 2009. Dominic was convicted of attempted bribery in 2013 for offering a judge $100,000 during a grand jury probe of Mary's disappearance. Mary had 11 siblings and attended Danbury High School before marrying her first husband. She enjoyed painting and drawing as hobbies. Her disappearance, possibly from Southbury, Connecticut, remains unsolved. Kelly Morrissey disappeared on June the 12th, 1984, after leaving a friend's residence in Lynbrook, New York. She was last seen walking west on Earl Avenue in Merrick Road, presumably heading to Captain Video, a popular video store in the area. 
However, she never arrived at her destination, has never been heard from since. At the time of her disappearance, Kelly had a part-time job at a Shade and Venetian Blinds Packaging Factory. She lived with her mother, stepdad, and siblings, and step-siblings. Authorities do not believe she left voluntarily, as she made plans the following day, as well as she also left her paycheck behind and left all of her money and personal belongings at home. Notably, she vanished the day before an important final exam in her summer school social studies class. Kelly had been experimenting with alcohol and was known to hang out with older men, occasionally breaking her curfew, but her loved ones insisted she was not rebellious, or really no more rebellious than most teenagers. Tragically, one of Kelly's friends, Teresa Fusco, disappeared on November the 10th of 1984 and was found dead three weeks later, about five, we five blocks from her home. Several months later, another teenager, Jackie Martorella, went missing and was, was found weeks later herself. Both Fusco and Martorella had been sexually assaulted and strangled. Their bodies found dumped in open fields. Both cases to this day remain unsolved. Dennis Halstead, John Restivo, and John Coget were convicted of Fusco's murder, but were later exonerated after DNA testing didn't match either of them. Kelly had dated Coget in the past, and she also knew Halstead. Fusco and Martorella's Murders, as I said earlier, remain unsolved. Foul play is suspected in Kelly's disappearance. She's presumed deceased by law enforcement and her family. Sandy Ray's mother divorced in the early 1980s. Following the divorce, Sandy took on additional responsibilities and was regarded as the second mother of the household. 1984, Sandy moved out of her mother's home and stayed with a local girlfriend's family. She supported herself by working in local restaurants, but regularly visited her younger siblings at their mother's home. Sandy also served as a president of the Vocational in Industrial Club of America at her high school. On September the 19th of 1984, Sandy planned to walk to the convenience store near Highland Street and Bryan Road to get cigarettes. However, a group of her friends passed by and offered her a ride to the Windsor Bowling Alley, where Sandy's cousin worked. Although she asked her cousin for a ride, he was unable to leave work at the time. According to, his, to her cousin... Sandy made several phone calls from the alley shortly afterward, asking various people for a ride. She was last seen walking from the business with an unknown individual around 9 p.m. Sandy has never been seen or heard from since. While some investigations believe Sandy left voluntarily, her mother disagrees with this theory. Sandy's case is primarily classified as a non-family abduction by most agencies, and the police are investigating it as an endangered missing persons case. One theory suggests Sandy's former boyfriend may be involved, as he was physically abusive towards her. Although she moved in with her girlfriend several weeks before her disappearance, she still maintained contact with her ex-boyfriend. Another theory speculates Sandy may have accidentally overdosed on drugs at a party, and her body was disposed of. Sandy was known to be a party girl, and was also known to experiment with both drugs and alcohol. A third theory involves suit parties in the Shawnee area, where local men allegedly exchanged drugs and alcohol for sex with underage teenagers in local hotel rooms. However, there's no concrete evidence linking Sandy to any of these events, nor evidence that they occurred at all. Several potential witnesses in Sandy's case have passed away over the years. Despite searches in various locations, no evidence has ever been uncovered, and police continue to pursue, pursue leads. 
One detective investigating Sandy's disappearance believes she attended a party on the night she went missing and suggests that other party guests know what happened to her. However, there is no evidence to prove this theory, and their case remains unsolved. Linda K. Carroll was last seen in Crestview, Florida on September the 25th of 1984. Her parents dropped her off at her home on Kingston Road at 8.30 p.m. About a half hour later, neighbors heard screams coming from her home, followed by the sound of a car speeding away. Carol was reported missing the following day when she didn't show up for work at Showell Farms Incorporated. She has never been seen or heard from since. Carol never collected her last paycheck and her purse and shoes were missing from her home. The bed had been stripped with the sheets also missing. Clumps of hair were found scattered around the home. A note addressed to Linda's brother was found on the counter stating that she'd gone to Baker, Florida to do laundry and instructing him to wait for her. However, he was unable to visit her on the day of her disappearance. At the time of her disappearance as well, Linda was going through a divorce and custody battle. Her husband of five years, Dennis Carroll, had left in August and had taken their two young children, causing her distress as she was a devoted mother. Dennis admitted to stopping by her home on the night of September 25th, but claimed she wasn't there, so he left and went to his mother's home in Meridian, Mississippi. He remained a suspect in Linda's disappearance, although he was never charged with connection to her case. He passed away from cancer in 2014. Living alone at her Kingston Road home without electricity, Linda led a frugal lifestyle as she saved money for a divorce attorney. She was working at her first job and had obtained a driver's license recently, although she did not yet own a vehicle. Described as an introvert with few friends, her case remains unsolved, with foul play suspected. Kelly Harris was last seen riding her red three-speed bike near her family's home on Lincoln Court in Jackson, Michigan on the morning of August 10th, 1984. Her family became concerned when she didn't return home later that evening. The same day her bicycle was found at the entrance of the Ellis Sharp Park, a short distance from the family home. Further investigation revealed that Kelly had purchased a bus ticket to Detroit, Michigan and was seen boarding a bus to, the de to that destination at the local station. Despite these clues, none have ever been confirmed. On the day of her disappearance, Kelly was reportedly upset because she was unable to attend the county fair. Initially considered a runaway, foul play is now suspected in her disappearance. Kelly had previously lived with her dad in Pasadena, Maryland until 1984, when she moved to Michigan to spend the summer with her mother. Her plan was to later relocate to California to live with her great-aunt. Leonard Hugel, Kelly's stepfather at the time of her disappearance, is the prime suspect in her case, since police began investigating it as a crime. Hugel and Kelly's mother divorced in 1994. Hugo has a history of violent behavior and child molestation, predating his relationship with Kelly. Hugo, who was admitted to being evil, was convicted of burglary, theft, and sexual battery in Florida in 1993. Kelly's mother stated that Kelly's relationship with Hugo was strained in 1984, and she believes he murdered her child. Initially claiming that Kelly had run away from home, Hugo refused to cooperate with authorities, as well as take a lie detector test. However, in 2006, Hugo confessed to raping and murdering Kelly. Blood evidence was found to corroborate his statement. Although Hugo will not face charges related to Kelly's presumed death until his scheduled release from prison sometime nine years from now in 2033, Efforts will be made to locate Kelly's remains based on information provided by Hugel. 
However, due to the significant passage of time that's now gone by, it's unlikely that anything will ever be recovered, as her body may have been disturbed or destroyed by animals, if not buried deeply. Some agencies may cite August the 14th of 1984 as the date of Kelly's disappearance, and it remains classified as a non-family abduction. Eugene Martin was last seen between 5.30 and 6 a.m. on August the 12th of 1984 in his hometown of Des Moines, Iowa, as he prepared to begin his morning paper route. Normally, Eugene delivered papers with his older stepbrother, but on that day, his stepbrother wasn't able to deliver any papers. Witnesses saw Eugene engage in a conversation with a man between 5 and 5.15 a.m. on 12th Street and High, High View Drive. The man was described as clean-cut and appeared to be in his 30s. He, to this day, remains unidentified. The interaction seemed to be friendly. Now, with that said... With that said, around 7.15 a.m., Eugene's route manager contacted his family to report that Eugene's newspaper sack had not been retrieved from the corner of 14th and Highview Streets. When the manager called again around 7.30 to confirm the papers remain unclaimed, Eugene's father contacted the authorities. Eugene's disappearance occurred in the same area where Johnny Gosh was last seen in 1982 which is also definitely worth noting. While it's unclear to most whether or not the two cases are related, both boys were newspaper delivery boys in the Des Moines area at the time of their disappearances. Now, Eugene loved football, fishing, and watching television. Playing video games was one of his other additional favorite pastimes. His parents eventually divorced after he went missing. Both have also since passed away, as Eugene Martin's case remains unsolved. Terry Sovey was last seen in Millington, Michigan on September the 22nd, 1984. Although she lived in Pontiac, Michigan, she traveled to Millington that summer with a man named William Bibby. He was later found to have committed several crimes in the area. According to Bibby's account to investigators, he and Sovi had been driving to a rural area and parked their car behind a farmhouse situated in an undeveloped swampy area. It was there that they engaged in a heated altercation, after which Sovi reportedly left to meet someone nearby and remain there. Bibby claimed to have lost his keys during the altercation, prompting him to go away on foot, abandoning his car, leaving it behind at the farmhouse. However, Sovi has never been seen or heard from since. Unfortunately, potential witnesses in the case declined to cooperate in the investigation. Following Sovi's disappearance, Bibby served time in prison for thefts he'd committed in Millington, Upon his parole to Troy, Michigan in 1993, he vanished from the area sometime between September and November of that year, effectively disappearing from sight. Authorities have been unable to determine Bibby's current whereabouts, and neither do his family members. Consequently, Bibby is now classified as a missing person himself, with an outstanding warrant for his arrest due to parole violations. Despite extensive efforts, including searches of local swampy areas with dogs, no evidence has been found in connection with so in Sovi's disappearance. Law enforcement officials have been continuing to try to locate Bibby, should he still be alive, in order to conduct further interviews regarding the case. However, the circumstances around Sovi's case to this day remain unclear. Lucinda Hules was last seen on October the 27th, 1984, in Tampa, Florida. She left her home in Hillsborough County, Florida, that day to go to the laundromat. That was the last time anyone had ever heard from her. During some point that evening, 
she went to a female friend's house and they went out for drinks at the Charpel Lounge on Bush Avenue in Tampa. At the bar, Lucinda began talking to a man named Larry Moore. He told her he owned a sign-making and cleaning business and offered her a job. She agreed to start work in two days. Lucinda's friend left the bar, leaving her behind with Moore. In the early hours of the morning, Moore and another man were found asleep in their vehicle on the roadside. The police saw them and they were arrested for marijuana possession, carrying concealed weapon. Lucinda wasn't with them and she hadn't been reported missing at that point. When he was questioned about her disappearance later, he said he didn't know where she was. It wasn't clear whether Moore was ever viewed as a suspect in Lucinda's disappearance. Her car was found at the Sharpal Lounge parking lot the, the following morning with clean and folded laundry inside and the keys missing. Two weeks after her disappearance, her purse was found in the men's bathroom at Bush Garden Zoo Campground with her cash, driver's license, and marriage certificate inside it. There is no indication, however, of her whereabouts. She left behind a husband and two children. Her family didn't believe she would have abandoned them. At the time of her disappearance, she was planning her son's second birthday party. Authorities initially suspected Lucinda was the victim of serial killer Bobby Joe Long. Long admitted to murdering 10 women in the Tampa area during an eight-month stretch in 1984, but he denied any involvement in Lucinda's case. Bobby was executed in 2019. In April of 1992, seven and a half years after her disappearance, Lucinda's daughter got a call from a woman who claimed to be her. The woman explained that she'd run away back in 1984 to escape the responsibility of motherhood and marriage. She'd been living in Tennessee and Arkansas, using the name Amanda. Lucinda's family invited the woman back home, and she came to live with them. The woman looked a lot like Lucinda and seemed to know a lot about the family. She lived with Lucinda's family until September of 1992, but blood tests proved she was not Lucinda. She turned out to be an Arkansas woman named Amanda Dennis, who'd run away as a teenager. Because the woman knew enough about Lucinda to convince many members of her family that she was the same person, some theorized she met Lucinda at some point after her disappearance. Now, circumstances around surrounding Lucinda's case are unclear. However, foul play is suspected. Her husband never married after her disappearance, and her children still hope to one day get answers as to what happened to their mother.